I'm so glad that uh, you tuned in for week three of our communication series uh, called Let's Talk. And so we're going to keep this up. We're going to keep talking because here's the thing. uh, We actually believe that communication is the number one thing that impacts every relationship. And so if we get better at communicating, our relationships improve. And if we stay the same or we decline in our ability to communicate, every single thing suffers because of that. And with everything taking place in our world right now, with the the way that the ground seems to be shifting under our feet weekly, daily, and sometimes even hourly, here's what I think. I think our ability to communicate for us to actually listen and hear and receive things and to say things in ways that connect in land is actually perhaps more important now than it's ever been. And so this is going to build on what we've talked about the last number of weeks. And so if you missed those, uh, they are on our website. I want to encourage you to maybe check that out, New Hope dot rocks slash messages and you can see the first two weeks of this series if you missed those and you can also check out messages for years in the past so so feel free uh, to go there as we begin today I just want to say a couple things and the first one's a shout out can I give a shout out yeah yeah Yeah? all right can I give a shout out at home all right good uh so i, I want to give a shout out to kendra dice when we were building the the teaching uh schedule for 2020 it was some excellent thoughts that she contributed that really inspired this whole series this month uh on communication so i want to give a shout out to kendra she was actually uh scheduled to teach with me this weekend and uh this kendra this is our second failed attempt and i take full responsibility uh, for this. This one's my fault completely uh, because on, on my day off and on my family day this week, I spent about 20 extra hours just doing stuff, trying to figure out life in this new world that we live in. And so I wasn't able to coordinate. Uh, I'm, I am really excited. Kendra, I appreciate not only your excellent thinking, uh, but we're going to make this happen. We're actually going to, you know, we're going to teach a message together. And, uh, and here's what I believe. Um, us hearing from Kendra, us hearing her voice directly from her, is going to be just such a benefit and a blessing to us. Uh, her, her, she just has an incredible voice. She is a great communicator. Here's the fun part. She just doesn't know how good she is yet. Uh, Kendra, you are way better than you know. I know you're amazing at what you do uh, in your day job, but you're going to be amazing, and you are amazing at this too. And and so number two, the the second thing I want to say as we get going today is is just a word about counselors. I want to share a word about counselors. And Kendra, who I just mentioned, is actually a counselor. That's what she does uh, with her day job. And for me, she has been incredibly helpful just to talk to, to process things with. Uh, But sometimes, as much as I love her and I love that profession, sometimes uh, I actually feel bad. I feel bad for her. Um, and, uh, and that's because a, a lot of times I, I think back to how I felt about counseling before Bethany and I got some counseling. And, and I also think to, to the things that I hear people saying and the ways that they seem to feel uh, about counseling. And, and it's sort of this idea that there's this stigma out there that the people who, who go to counseling, who the people who need counseling, man, they're the ones who are really messed up. Right? Like, like all of us are a little bit messed up. We all kind of know that. But it's like this offensive idea if someone says, you should talk to a counselor or you should go to counseling. Like, what do you mean? I'm not that messed up. Like, I don't need counseling. And, and so I think in some ways, maybe Bethany and I in sharing our story so openly over the years uh, have done a disservice. Sort of like maybe some people have started to think, wow, it's so good when Rob and Bethany were in a really bad spot that they got some counseling and they were able to work through that because they were sort of bad then and they're good now, right? Like, like we are different people. 
And, and we're different because we're older and we've survived more things and we've had more experiences. But, but I want you to know, I'd say this, Bethany would say this, we talked about it even this week. Um, we're the same people. Rob and Bethany before counseling and Rob and Bethany after counseling, we're still Rob and Bethany. Uh, and, and so what I want to say there is every single one of us needs help with communication, right? We, we all need help. And, and, and I want to say this for those of you who maybe think, oh, I don't want to go to a counselor. They're going to do some kind of weird voodoo on me. Listen, they're not witches. They're counselors, right? They don't cast spells and do kind of strange things. If they do, that's really not a counselor. You should leave that, right? Um, and so you should, you should know that, that my experience anyway is, man, having someone who is trained to be able to listen and help us process things in a very normal way is just really extremely healthy. And, you know, sometimes I'm almost tricked because sometimes I, I talk to people or interact with people and they say things like this to me. Oh, we're good. Like we, we just, we communicate so well. Like there's almost never an issue. And so when I encounter people like this occasionally, and I want to be honest, it's really rare, especially people who have been together, been married for a long time. It's very rare to hear those words. Uh, but sometimes, I, and I'm like, man, they're just the exception to the rule. And, and so I almost get tricked. And almost 100% of the time, at some point, I learn that one of them's not honest and one of them's a little bit delusional. And it's usually the guy, right? It's usually us guys who just think everything's great. And uh, ladies, you just haven't clued us in yet. Uh, I think everybody should go to counseling just like we go every year to the doctor for a checkup. I think that that's just a, a healthy practice for everyone, whether you think you need it or not. Because here's the thing, communication is complicated. This is complicated stuff. And we all need help. Uh, all the help we can get. So I want to pray for us, and then we're going to take another step today in really building on, hopefully, our ability to be able to communicate. Because there is something that, that most people do, in some ways, maybe all of us do a little bit, or, or maybe a lot, that seems like it's communicating, it seems like it's communication to us, but it's really not. It, it's actually sabotaging our ability to successfully communicate. So let's pray. God, I just ask today that you would give us ears to hear. Father, help us to not simply listen to your word and your words and so deceive ourselves. God, may we learn something new and then help us to actually live what we learn. No matter no matter how challenging or difficult it may be. We ask these things together today in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, uh, I want to talk to us a little bit uh, about this idea of triangles of death. Dun, 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 right? Doesn't that, like, that's a title that sounds like it requires a dun, 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 right? Like, you, it has to kind of go along with that. Some of you are like, okay, wait a minute. It's a little bit melodramatic, right? That kind of title. We're talking about communication. We're not talking about life or death. Why, why, why are you using the D word, Rob, right? And, and some of you, maybe you're thinking to yourself, I don't want no drama, drama, right? Like that's kind of what we're thinking here. And, and, and maybe for some of us, we're, we're fully aware of our failures to communicate. And it's like, I don't need you to make me feel worse about the times that I've really messed this communication thing up. What in the world are triangles of death anyway? There is a devastating practice the business world recognizes this. The leadership world recognizes this. And this practice is called triangulation, 
right? We actually uh, put on our Facebook page a seven-minute video that talks about this and talks about it from the, the vantage point of leadership. And if you haven't seen it, I would encourage you maybe go to our Facebook page. That's just facebook.com slash newhope. Uh, dot rocks. Uh, check that video out. If you don't have Facebook, you can also find it on YouTube by, uh, by searching for Edwin uh, Friedman uh, and his book, Failure of Nerve. And it'll be like the second video down and there's like somebody drawing pictures. It's powerful. It's powerful. I want to encourage you. I think it's the best uh, video on this topic and for leaders. And, and the whole idea is that, that healthy leaders and healthy organizations or groups of people actually resist triangulation and will stand in the tension and, and really not allow this practice to continue. So we don't want to take seven minutes to show you that video, but I do want to show you a shorter one-minute video that's going to help all of us get quickly up to speed and exactly what triangulation is. So check this out. This is a triangle. This represents what happens in families, between friends, and very often in the workplace. Person A has a problem with person B, and what do they do? They go to person C and say, guess what person B just did? Sometimes it's necessary to go to a third party. If it's a legal issue, maybe sexual harassment or bullying, then yes, a third party mediator is important. But usually coworkers can resolve their conflict with each other if they decide to directly negotiate. An organization can decide to adopt the practice of non-triangulation. This is, instead of going to a third person and pulling them into the drama, the two parties deal with their issue directly. Person A might say to person B, hey, can we talk about that thing that happened? If person A neglects to practice on triangulation and goes to person C, person C can say, uh-uh, I believe you two can work this out. Adopt non-triangulation. Take the time to problem solve, show respect, establish trust. Be a line, not a triangle. So good, right? And, uh, I love the caveat that we saw there too. Um, what we're going to talk about today applies in virtually all situations, but, the, but there are a couple exceptions, right? When it's a legal issue, uh, sometimes we need to pull someone else in. Uh, when life is uh, sort of going to be diminished or in danger, uh, this is a good time to, to sort of skip some of this. We can throw this stuff out. We pull someone else in. But in virtually every other circumstance, what we're going to talk about today not only applies, but it is critical if we want to be good at communication. Uh, businesses recognize the danger of triangles. Leadership does as well. Virtually every area of life recognizes that avoiding triangulation is a universal best practice. So is it any wonder that Jesus brought this up long before all these other areas and fields were thinking about it? Right? Like, this happens a lot, isn't it? Like, this stuff kind of originates with God. It starts with Jesus. And Jesus talks about this in Matthew 18, in just a few verses, in verses 15, 16, and 17. And I, I want you to hear this. For many of you, this will be a familiar passage. And even if it's not familiar to you, it's really simple. And it, sim it says this, If your brother or sister sins... Go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, Treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So the idea here is anytime there is a 
problem, you know, dot, dot, dot. And, and I know some of you are like, wait a minute, Rob, wait a minute. That's not what it said, right? It said if it actually, instead of brothers and sisters, the, the better translation of the Greek term is fellow disciple, man or woman, male or female, doesn't matter. So, so fellow disciple, if a fellow disciple sins, and some manuscripts make it even more personal if they sin against you, right? So this isn't just sort of some general, someone has wandered off the path and you want to help them back. But this is more a direct attack, sometimes an offense against you. Two ways to think about that. Um, you know, that's what this is talking about. And so, Rob, this isn't just some, some general, any old problem kind of thing. But let me make my point. Jesus says that when something is a really big deal, right, um, the first step is for us to go alone. Now, don't we usually think the bigger the deal, the more help and reinforcements we need, right? So if it's a big deal, I really need some people with me. If it's a little deal, it's, it's, it's not that, that, that important. So if the first step is to go by ourselves when something is big and we may want more help, how much more important is it that we begin this way when it's a little thing, right? When, when we may not think or, or realize we, we need that. So this is a universal idea. This doesn't just apply when someone has sinned or, or sinned against us. This is a universal thing, not just in dealing with issues of that type. So anytime there is a problem, we are given three sequential steps on what to do, right? And I've already given you the first one. The first one is go alone, right? Go alone alone. Let me say go alone differently to you, can I? Avoid triangles of death. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Right? Like avoid that. Which, oh by the way, it is every triangle. Right? It's not, oh I gotta avoid the triangles of death so I'll just do, no, no, no. It, virtually every triangle falls into this category. So we by ourselves go directly to the source we make a line instead of a triangle. One is good, the line is good, the other is not, the triangle isn't. Uh, this is important for so many reasons. But I just wanna give you one reason today that I think will really help this sink in for us. And I wanna do that and illustrate it by showing you this video, check this out. Tonight, my husband's been acting weird. We had made plans to meet at a nice restaurant for dinner. I'd been shopping with my sisters all day long, spent a little more than I intended, and got to the restaurant a teensy bit late. So I figured he'd be upset. He didn't say anything, but I could just tell. I braced myself for impact. I knew at some point it would come up. I just knew he'd been sitting there waiting for me, thinking about my poor time management and how I'm always late for everything. His small talk at dinner did little to cover up the anger that I knew was right below the surface. He made it all the way through dinner and still hadn't mentioned anything. That meant the car ride on the way home was practically grueling. I did lean over at one point and told him that I love him. He smiled slightly, but kept on driving, lost in his angry thoughts, I'm sure. We were home early enough to watch some TV. I turned it on and was pleased when he joined me on the couch, but when I offered to let him pick the show, he said, you pick, like as if he was too frustrated to even care. I can just tell he's mad at me, but how am I supposed to fix it if he won't even talk to me? How will I ever reach him? That guy at dinner in the Star Wars t-shirt got me wondering, why did R2-D2 never tell Luke Skywalker that Darth Vader was his father?
isn't that great? <laughs> Ladies, seriously, I want you to hear this. Like 98% of the time or higher, that's literally what's happening inside of here. Like it's just the truth. All the stuff that, and it illustrates a great point, doesn't it? I mean, how many times are those things that we think are issues, are, are they really just misunderstandings? And if we would have the courage to go quickly and immediately to the source and have a conversation, not in our own minds, but out loud, we would quickly solve these things, right? They would, they would literally uh, become nothing. And even when there is a, a bit of a problem or even a major problem, going directly to the source and talking to that person is actually the thing that gives us the best chance at the greatest success. So what happens you know, in a situation where you have gone to all kinds of other people with your prayer request, right? Or, or the issue that you have. And then after finally getting back to the source, you realize, uh-oh, it really wasn't a big deal. It, it, it was a misunderstanding. But you've already told a whole bunch of people, right? What happens in a situation like that? Is there any way to undo all that you've done? Or have you brought death instead of life to another person or another situation? Because you didn't follow this. And even if it was a, a real issue, I see this kind of stuff all the time in relationships, right? Where, where uh, uh, a husband and wife or, or a couple, doesn't matter, right? Like they have a major issue. There's this major concern. And, and, and they tell people, they tell people close to them. They tell friends and family members. And then the two of them work it out. They forgive each other. But the friends and the family members that they sort of shared all the dirt about that other scoundrel with, their relationship is never again the same. And that's not on them. It's on us when we've done that. I mean, think about this. It, especially if you're a dad out there and you have daughters and you learned that some guy that you trusted your princess with has hurt her, right? Like, are you ever going to think about him the same way again? No. We've got to be careful. We've got to go alone first. I want to give us 30 seconds, just 30 seconds. And I don't, I don't know, maybe you're by yourself watching this. Maybe you're with others. But I just want you to reflect for 30 seconds. And I just have two questions. One is this. Is there a situation in your life? Is there someone that you need to go directly to? Pretty simple, right? And, and you can spend more time thinking about this later. But for many of us, maybe someone that is coming to mind. There's a situation maybe we've even thought about or even started to talk more broadly. Is there someone you need to go directly to? And then kind of a second question to build on that. Is there a person you need to seek forgiveness from for talking to someone other than them? Right? Like there's a situation and you have, a, your, your, your issue is with someone, but you've talked to, to others instead of going to that person. And listen, church, here's the thing. Um, social distancing does not get you out of doing this, right? Oh, Rob, I would, but I'm quarantined. I can't, no, no. It, so I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Think about those questions. Is there someone you need to go directly to? And is there someone you need to approach and ask forgiveness from because you have talked to others about your issue with them? 30 seconds. Let's reflect on that. All right. So what do we do in those situations where we've done everything we can? We've gone directly to the source. We've done it alone, right? Like, like the, the text tells us. And there's still no change. 
right? The issue still persists. There's no progress. There's no movement. Then what? Uh, well, the text then tells us to go back with one or two others, right? And, and so, and I would say this is not one of those things where you're like, well, I went. It's been eight seconds. There's no change, so I'm going to get my posse and we're going to ride in, right? Like, that's not what's going on here, right? I've gone to someone. I've gone alone. I've given them some time to sort of let that settle in for them to process it. And then if that doesn't work, I take preferably one other person. Uh, no more than two, maybe two, not three or four, not the entire small group, because I had them praying anyway, right? Not the pastor, the staff person they serve with, and my counselor as a whole team to go talk to them. One or two, right? Alone first, and then one or two. And I want you to hear this. This is really, really, really important. They need to be wise people. If you're taking someone with you in a situation like this, they have got to be wise people. And wise people will not let you triangulate with them. They just won't. Here's what I mean by this. If you're trying to identify the kind of person that you should take in a situation like this, and it, they will stop you and not allow the conversation to continue. If you come to them and says, oh, I got a problem. I need to talk about so-and-so. They will literally, if it's a wise person, they will stop you and say, wait, 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 wait. Have you talked to them? And if your answer is no, they will be like, listen, you've got to go to them first before we have this conversation, right? This is what wise people do. We use the term maturity far too lightly, don't we? Oh, that person's mature. Oh, they've got, you know how long they've gone to church? You know how long they've known Jesus? And they're such a nice person. I like them so much. None of that matters. If they will let you triangulate or they invite you into a triangle of theirs, they are not spiritually mature. It's, there's, there's no, there's no other way around that. So what I want to do now is, is I want to take a minute, uh, not 30 seconds, a whole minute, but we're going to do this differently. This isn't a time to reflect so much. Uh, if you're at home and you have other people with you, around you, I want you to have a little one-minute conversation. For, for the few of us in the room, we, we can talk about this too. So here are the questions. If you ever have to take uh, others, who should you take? Not who could you take, who would like be quick to say, I'll go, but who should you take? Like, is there, is there a person in your life or a kind of person that you would say, yep, like this is, this is who I would take or this kind of person is someone I'd take? Uh, uh, maybe another question, if you ever have to take others in a situation like this, who should you avoid? Right? Like who maybe would love to go, but it just wouldn't work. And you know what? Like maybe... Um, you don't even want to name that person out loud, but you know what? Saying something to someone else about, I know my relationship with this person is not he helpful or healthy. So let's just take one minute and let's have an initial conversation. You might want to and probably do want to continue this later, uh, but who is the kind of person, maybe name a name even, that you would want to take if you ever found yourself in a situation like this? And who's someone you would want to avoid taking with you? Let's talk about that.
All right, let's, uh, let's continue. So what do you do when, when you've gone alone, right? You've created the line, not the triangle. The, and after some time and with prayer, you take that next step and bring another person along with you, right? But, but things are still, you know, off. What do you do then? Well, then you, you take it to the group, right? And, uh, and here in the passage, the group is the church, right? You bring it to the church, uh, this, uh, in some situations, could maybe be like, hey, I'm bringing it to, like, a, a small group. That might be. Uh, it could be a family thing, right, where, like, I talk to this family member, and there's, there's been no progress, and I'm really concerned, and so the whole family then gets brought in. Uh, maybe it's, it's a business where there's, like, an issue with an employee, so we try to deal directly there, and now, now the business comes in. The, the larger community, right, the, the larger group of people. But hear this. This always happens last. Always happens last. This, this, this never happens first. It always happens last. And it should never be done with any joy. It just should never happen this way. Because this is not natural human interaction, right? For us to take an issue, uh, a concern of someone else, and, and bring it to uh, a group of people, especially a large group of people. In fact, what does the text say? This is like the last ditch effort before you sever the relationship, right? And then the, what does the text say? You're to treat that person like a tax collector or a pagan, right? Like this is, this is like I'm doing everything I possibly can and then this likely can't even continue after this. I have three final thoughts that I want to give you and a question I want to ask. But if you're listening to this and having dirt on someone else and sharing that causes you to feel any joy ever or causes you to feel like it gives you some kind of power because you know something, you may just want to let the rest of the words of this message wash over you and you may just want to pray that Jesus would give you his heart for people right? Because we should never feel powerful when we have dirt on someone. It should never bring us joy to, to, to do this, to talk about someone else's weakness. And so you just assume whatever posture you need to. So here's, here's a, a, the next thought. This order is on purpose, right? This order is on purpose. Uh, the idea of we go alone, and then we go with one, maybe two, and then we bring it to the group. This order is on purpose. We do not, sometimes we do this, right? We think that this is how it works, where I can take all these biblical thoughts, I can put them into a container and shake up the container, and then I open it and I, oh, this time I go to the group first, you know? No, like the order of this is on purpose. It starts with us going and saying, I think there's a problem. I think you have a, a problem. Let's talk about this problem. Not me and a bunch of others who are going to remain nameless. You know, so many people have talked to me about this. Well, who? Well, I can't really say because I promised them. I, no, no, this is like not at all a biblical thing that any person of faith should ever do or say. Amen? Amen. Come on, they're like at home, in your kitchens, in your living rooms, if you're sitting in bed watching on a big, I don't care, right? Like, no, like you gotta say amen there. This is a problem. Um, just me. And I have no weapons. I have no intent to harm you. There are no triangles here. And if and when others need to be added, they're not nameless. They are all in and fully known. Instead of Rob going to you, now it's Rob and Bethany, right? And it's just Rob and Bethany. It's not Rob and Bethany, and they told a whole bunch of other people who are kind of covering them as they go. And when we go, we go with, we love you, and we believe in you, and we want God's best for you. And it would give us no greater joy than to see you change and, and, and choose differently in a way that happens quietly and no one else ever even needs to know. 
Um, I, a number of years ago now, watched a church royally botch number three, right? The whole take it to the church thing. They actually used this text to do, to do this thing that they did. And it was with a couple that I was working with. I was doing their premarital counseling and, uh, and um, I performed the wedding. And uh, the church that one of them grew up in, uh, this couple, uh, before they were married, uh, had gotten pregnant. Uh, I don't think it was an immaculate conception, but you know, whatever. I'm, I, I'm not going to confirm or deny either way. Um, and, uh, and so the church that one of them grew up in said, hey, listen, and, th- and this, this couple was already remorseful. They knew that they, they got things out of order and they wanted to, to do it properly. Um, but the church one of them grew up in, that the other one didn't even know anyone that said, listen, if you want to be right, you've got to come to church. You've got to stand in front of the whole church and you've got to confess your sin. And I still remember hearing this. And like, I think my eyes, my eyes never get big because I've heard everything. My eyes were just getting bigger and bigger. And I'm like, and you did it? Like, uh, I can't, I can't even believe somebody would ask that. Now, some of you might be saying, well, well, God, uh, Rob, why? Why did, why did you say that? Why did you think that, right? Because isn't that what the Bible says? Like, you know, shouldn't you get, to get if this sin, right? And shouldn't you go to the church? Um, well, no, that's not what the text is saying. Again, they were already repentant, right? It didn't need to, to get bigger than it was. So, so why did I say this? Because this order is on purpose and its purpose is redemptive, right? Its purpose is redemptive, what is the, well, how does this text begin? If your brother or sister, if a fellow disciple has sinned or has sinned against you, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. And here's the key part. If they listen to you, you have won them over. The only biblical purpose that you or I have to approach someone, even just alone, no matter what they have done, is for their redemption, right? Um, Not because you know their secret, not to be the one who is going to catch them or punish them or shame them. If your purpose is not to help them and restore them um, uh, quietly, never telling another soul, You and I just can't go. We just can't go, no matter what they've done, no matter how bad it is. If our purpose is not God's purpose, is not redemption, we can't. Now, this is where those of us who are especially spiritual uh, practice what I kind of call more spiritual sinning, right? It's when we do something that's not quite right, but when other people, when we talk about it or they see it, they're like, wow, it just, they do, they're doing it so spiritual. It has to be okay, right? It has to be right. And, and, and so here's what we say, right? For those of us who are, who are more spiritual and so, and we think this is kind of okay, we, here's what we say. Well, at least I have God, Right? Right? Like, uh, I see how uh, not going quickly to the source, how letting something build in my head into something bigger maybe than it really is and not going to them, going to others and, and going with the wrong heart and motive, Rob, I see, I see how that could lead to death. And, and I even see that maybe I've not really done this perfectly or even well in the past. For all of us, I'm sure we have room to grow, right? We got, we got wiggle room here. We can, we can get better. But even though I can't rush to those things anymore, I can always talk to God, right? Like God is safe. He's exempted from this, right? God, God's not like a triangle, is, is he? Well, here's what I'd say. Yes and no. God is exempted and he isn't. God is absolutely the best and most helpful one to turn to always, but I have watched God in, in relationships turn into a triangle of death as well. So, so I want to give you something, like if you're like, that's not, that doesn't sound right. I, you know, no, how can you say that? No, I, talk to God. Pray about it before you go, as you go, <laughs> while you're there, after. Absolutely. But, but if you want to see what I mean, try this. Especially if you're married, try this. So, so go to your spouse and say, hey, listen, 
God and I have been talking, and we both agree that there's this list of things in your life that I'm going to give you um, that should be different and better. See how that goes. <laughs> Do you see how that is creating a triangle of death? Right? Because you and God, like you have now made yourself and God not the advocate, not the teammate of your spouse or whoever that other relationship is, but you've made God along with you the opponent or even the enemy of your spouse. See, God is not for you and against your spouse any more than he's for your spouse and against you. He is for both of you. He's not on your side if it means being against someone else. So we got to avoid this triangle probably most of all. Now there's another term, a common term, a biblical term, yes, but it's a simple term that we've all heard for what we've been talking about, right? For these triangles of death. So here's the term, gossip. You've heard that term, right? Gossip. Now sometimes we think that what gossip is, it's sharing things about others that aren't true. Like they gossip. Can you believe what they said about me? That's not even true. No, that's not, that's not what gossip is. Uh, when you say something about someone that's not true, that's called slander, right? And you can actually be held legally liable for saying things that aren't true about someone else. No, gossip is sharing things that aren't yours, Right? Let me give you the dictionary definition of gossip. Here it is. Gossip is the sharing of private information about others in conversation or print. Doesn't matter if it's true or false. Um, if there's someone else's private information that you're sharing with anyone in any way, that's gossip. And while gossip is kind of a general people problem, I hate to say things like this, even more, it's a church people problem. I see gossip and I deal with gossip at every level all the time. And it's almost always from people who have good hearts and love Jesus and want to see life, want to see redemption. But they've become blinded to just how much death this practice of gossip and triangulation truly causes. So before this moment's gone, right? Because at some point, if we just give it a few more minutes, we'll, we'll begin to embrace this lie, right? That, oh, I, I'm, not, I'm not all that bad at communication, right? And, and, and Rob, I only tell things to, to my closest friends and those who need to know, uh, right? That can't be that big a deal, right? It can't be that bad. That won't. It hasn't. It doesn't bring death, really, does it? Come on. So I just want you to listen to these few words from James, the brother of Jesus. He says, Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Ugh. <laughs> so as we wrap up week three of Let's Talk. I just want you to hear this. These triangles, these triangles of death, church, they happen in so many ways. It's when I have a problem with my spouse, but instead of talking to my spouse, I talk to my mom. It's when I have a problem with my boss, but instead of talking to my boss, I, I talk to my coworker. It's when I have a problem with one friend, but instead of talking to them, I talk to another friend. It's when I have a problem with someone at church, and so I gossip as spiritually as I can to anyone and everyone who will listen. Listen, create lines, not triangles. Triangles only ever bring and cause death. It's just how they work. So I want to ask a question. Have you created any triangles of death. The band's going to start playing, and, and I just want you to think about that. And, and, and maybe where you are, if you're in this room, great. 
If, if you're at home, I don't, even if you're just by yourself and you're like, I don't need to do this because no one's even around to see me. Uh, maybe there's people around you. Maybe you're having a little watch party. Maybe you have 87 children and they're all like there huddled around watching. It doesn't matter. Would you just bow your head and, and reflect on this? How we've lived in our lives? Have we created lines or have we created triangles? See, for some of us, Maybe we haven't done too badly, but man, there was that one time, right? Like, we, we just didn't even think about it. We, we talked to some people. We just knew this was a big deal. We knew this was a serious thing, and, and, and it turned out not to be. And we just destroyed a relationship or a person because of how much we shared and how much we made a mountain out of a molehill. For some of us, maybe we don't have one of those huge epic fail stories, but for some of us... The truth is that, that this has become a bit of a habitual thing for us, of just a part of our lifestyle that, that, that we have information and we share it. And, and we don't do it necessarily with a bad heart, but we've become a little bit numb to the fact that doing this, it doesn't bring life, it creates death. I don't care if you just had one epic fail or, or man, this has been a bad thing for you. See, this is a series about communication. So the point isn't to feel bad, it's to do better, right? We want to do better. We want to take steps. And so, so if you start this, if you start this triangulation business, or if you keep doing this, if you, if you do it, it can never, ever lead where Jesus wants to take things, where Jesus wants to go. And, and here's the thing. I believe it doesn't lead where we want to go because we do. We want life. We want redemption. But this practice only ever leads to death. And so I want to pray for us today. We're going to close by, by singing a song, and I love this song. A lot of people won't, won't even sing this song, won't play this song. I love this song, and it's, it's so perfect here. Because it talks about the reckless love of God, how God chases us down. And I wonder today how many of us need the reckless love of God for us? And how many of us need this reckless love of God to go through us? See, for some of us, here's the thing. We don't have the heart of Jesus. And we just need to have an encounter with him this morning that causes us to know just how overwhelming the love of God is. That you need the reckless love of God for you. That you need to know that God is chasing you down and he wants to love you and change you and shape you and mold you. But it doesn't stop there. It starts there, but, but then we need to let that same love flow through us so that when we have to go to people one-on-one -on -one, in those rare occasions where we have to bring someone else along, that it's only ever for redemption. It's only ever to make a difference. See, you don't need to be in this place. And I just want to encourage you as we do this song, assume the right posture. You know, you can, you can sit if that's the best for you. You can stand. I don't care if there's people around you in your kitchen. doesn't matter. You can kneel. Maybe for some of you, you just want to get on your face before God. Do not let this moment pass. I want, church, I want us to receive this right now. Let's let God change us and make us different so that we can be better communicators and make a bigger difference. Jesus today for all of us, God, we, we all in some ways, in little ways, in big ways, we struggle with this. It's so easy to, to bring other people into the loop instead of going directly to the source, directly to the person. And God, for every one of us, we can't turn our TVs on. We can't log into Facebook without someone trying to triangulate us and bring us into something. You agree with me, right? You disagree with them. Can you believe they did that? Can you believe they're not doing that? Oh, God, we're inundated. And so meet us. God, help us to receive your love and help us to share your love and help us to knock off this triangulation that goes against the direct teaching and command of Jesus. God, we love you. So in these minutes, God, as, as we just posture ourselves before you, do what only you can in us and through us.
Not only so that we're better communicators, but God, so that we can better communicate your redemption and your love with our world. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.